Is my mic gone? Oh, it's okay. Because it was a hiss, slight hiss. Right. Oh, you mean they were hissing at me? No, no, no. <laughs> that Thanks that they very weren't. much. Now, what I've got is a list of questions. He doesn't know anything about me. I don't know absolutely nothing about you, so I'm going to ask you questions that have been uh, given to me by several people. Now, first of all, question one, how did you get your part as Liz Shaw? There we go. Answer one. <laughs> I sound like filling in a form for the DHS. Correct. <laughs> I couldn't get... I'd been at the National Theatre for a long time, and I couldn't get anyone to see me in television because they were all a bit overpowered by the mm. sort of working with Laurence Olivier, Albert Finney and those people. So I had a photograph taken of me in a bikini and sent it round. And I got a lot of answers, <laughs> <laughs> which says a lot for the... Uh, oh, I've got gold paint all over me. Um, it's all the signing autographs. Right. Um, all these directors asked me, and you see, of course, then I arrived. I wasn't quite such a... <laughs> cumbersome thing with my clothes on. Anyway, I was called in to see Doctor Who. Um, Derek Sherwin, Peter Bryant, had an interview with them, went away, and then they asked me to do it. Good. So, so I was very pleased. Right. The next question is, well, you may not want to ask this, it says, you were cast as a knowledgeable scientist. Have you any scientific background? Answer number two, no. <laughs> Oh no, that's not one out of the way. <laughs> did, you, did you feel like you were becoming more knowledgeable as, as, as it went on there? Well, they had very difficult words. I used to go to the library and look them up and see if they had any real meaning. I tried to get a bit of background. Mm. I made her come from Cambridge as if she was doing research in various things. Mm. And that was why I was cho pr um, I was going to say probe, which is the latest thing, unit, called me in which was the, an army thing with Nick Courtney, the right. head of. So that's how you got involved? Yes. Right. How did... Uh, this is another question. Number how three. did filming on your first story go? Now, how did the filming go with your first story? Right. First filming, I was like this. Like when I went to Monopticon last year, I was like this. Um, I didn't really... It was very simple because we did all the outside filming first mm. in Doctor Who and then you'd go inside things changed on the first one because we did the outside filming, went to do the read-through, and they said, see you in Evesham tomorrow. And I said, I was living at Ipswich. I, thought it was, I said, it's not April the 1st, is it? And suddenly, I hadn't had the letter to tell me, can you hear me, because this is yeah. gone, that there was a strike at the BBC, and it was all going to be put on film instead of done in the studio and we had to be in Evesham the next door, day to start. Of course. So I had to nip back home, get my gear and get up to Evesham. Mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. right? Right. Right. Next. It, it was during your time that John... You should have just read these out. Yes, I know. It was during your time that John Pertwee first introduced his yellow car, Bessie. But was it hard to film with the car? I didn't drive. Oh, well, I know. So you just sat... It was very easy for me because I just got in there. It's double de clutch. so um, the chap who was doing my stunt work went round this airfield with me lots of times to get ready, and then they put in the cameraman and the director and the sound man, and then I put my foot on the accelerator, and, just went. and we just zoomed. And oh. as they all got out afterwards, they all looked as white as chalk, and I was quite happy. I didn't know I'd been going so far. <laughs> oh dear. It says here, who designed your costumes? Do you know that? Well, Christina Rawlins was in charge of wardrobe, mm. who I've just worked with on the choir. It's going out currently at the moment. It's the first time I've worked with her since, so she was in charge of all that. Mm. What do you think of the scripts that you had? <coughs> I don't know. I don't know. He says, what do you think of the scripts? Do you think you were cast as a good character, or...? Yeah, I think this was very good because before it had always been... And I think I'm the only girl who doesn't scream in Doctor Who. I don't know, everybody else knows this. But I don't think I ever screamed, did I? Mm. Come on, you're she all the aficionados. Mm. <laughs> Clever clogs. <laughs> yeah, she did briefly, obviously, yes. But um, she was meant to be more adult and 
I think the Avengers was going on about that time, so they were trying oh, to get a more sophisticated thing, and John was, it was a good partnership in that respect, that we had a sort of twinkle in the eye at really the Brigadier's expense a lot of the time. Since doing your first episodes, have you watched any more since, have you? Yes. And what do you think of yourself, looking back? Well, I have to go back a bit, because when I finished, I only was in it a year, as everybody here knows, mm. um, I was very young and I didn't think I was very good. Oh. And then, John Molyneux, who's standing over there, sent me some takes, and I saw Silurians first. Oh, I think the BBC sent me one. And I looked at it and I thought, what's wrong with that? That's fine. You know, so it was only my paranoia, I suppose. Or I don't think people were very encouraging in those days. Mm. Had you watched it before you actually were in it? Doctor Who as well? Yes, occasionally. I mean, I come from a family of eight, so mm. one member of the family would probably be watching, watching yeah. it. Right. You had quite a lot of action in The Ambassadors of Death. I've got to try and read this. Different. Did you feel Liz was more of an action character rather than a screamer? Oh, that there is. But did you feel you were much more of an action character than just an, an assistant? Mm. I don't know how to answer that. I mean, she had a lot of action in that one, and I was three months pregnant when I did it. Mm. And I had to run across a weir, and I didn't fall in the um, stunt man. Did. Stunt man. Who had yeah. long hair and a, this ridiculous white hat. <laughs> Looks Nathna, and but they had to pull me out of the water. Yeah, they had to push me over and pull me out. It's cold. It was only my feet in it. Oh, I saw. It was, was a it bit not? dodgy though, because it's very fast the weir at Marlow. In your final story, Inferno, you got to play section leader Shaw, and alter ego. Did you enjoy doing that? Yes, it's lovely because you you won't know, but she had always been sort of all for the good, and this woman, it's like another world in which Nick Courtney and I were baddies. It was like our other alternative person. Mm. But when I watched it quite recently, I thought, this is quite interesting, because you can see how both characters come from the same source, and I hadn't realized. I don't know if I was aware of that when I did it. But actually, you could see, oh yes, I can see why she's bad now, mm. because the influence of this horrible world. It was like being a sort of commandant in a concentration camp, the baddie Liz Shaw. And the other one was sort of all nice, I think. How come you haven't done too many conventions? I didn't do any till last year. Is that um, right? I, th I don't know if people have heard this, but I was a bit scared off, I think. And because I didn't think I was very good in it. Ah. And I saw the Silurians and I thought, it's alright if it was my daughter, I'd be very pleased for her, you know. And then John Molyneux, who's over there, wanted me, wrote to me a lovely long letter and said, I know you're frightened, I know this, that and the other, I don't know how he knew, but he that's what the letter said. Will you come to Monocton? And I thought, well, before I die, I'll go and see what it's like. So he did. <laughs> and you must have enjoyed it, because you come back for another one. That's right. It says here, what, uh, we might have covered this, have you? what does it feel like to be the first Doctor Who girl of the 70s? It was like a, Nobody's a, asked me that. Oh, weird sort of question. Well, I do, I remember watching it and thinking, my nose is too long. <laughs> As you see, if ever you see me coming around the corner, you see this huge nose. <laughs> and in those days, it was retrousse noses. Mm. So if I hadn't been pregnant, I'd have had my nose changed. I was as far gone as that. Oh dear. Shows how silly we are, doesn't it? Mm. Well, would, you, would you play this show again on a regular basis if I asked her? Yes, because we all need money. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually have played Liz Shaw just lately. Um, mm -hmm. Bill Baggs, they um, very enterprisingly, Doctor Who lot, do videotapes. Mm -hmm. And in one called Zero Imperative, I don't know if anyone's seen it, I do recreate Liz Shaw. And she has come in to find out why in this strange clinic things are going wrong. The police can't fathom there's lots of deaths, and mm -hmm. it's something to do with something out of the ordinary. Because you're a scientist, you don't Yes, know. so it's something to do with what's, you know, weird things happening. And Linda Lusardi plays my sidekick. Oh. And Louise Jameson, my boss. <laughs> right. So, I'm trying to get him to do another one, get the girls in. <laughs> More fun. Well, I'm, what I'm going to do is, we, I, we have a 
I'm, I'm radio microphone, and I'm going to go into the audience because we are figuring on one or two questions from the audience. So what I'm going to do is look around. It's a struggle to get them started. We have to look around for a hand to zoom up in the air, and as soon as it zooms up in the air, which will be in a minute, and just oh, there they go, right? Everybody, put your hands. <laughs> it, I'm busy trying to think of something. Right, I'm going to throw this to you. Take it. Uh, my name's Alan. Uh, yes. Could I ask you about uh, your Harry Enfield career? Um, did they actually write the sketch where they were taking the mid-air to Doctor Who? Do you recall? Yes. Under did, was that aimed at you, or had they already written the script? They had no idea that I'd been in Doctor Who, and I never told them. <laughs> <laughs> I tell them now, you see. And um, I love doing that. Um, rehearsals were great because they do lots of sketches you don't see because they might have ten, you're rehearsing one week, and you'll only see a few that actually come out. But I mean, it was just like my two sons. He and who's the other boy that, Paul Whitehouse. And I was just shrieking every day of rehearsal because they were so silly. And they reminded me of my two sons. And they're so rude. <laughs> Another question. Um, what was it like to work with those ridiculous masks, werewolf masks in Inferno? Did I? <laughs> what yes. is the werewolf? You mean the man that goes all funny, That's gets the all the hair? Yeah. I don't think Liz Shaw had much to do with him, did she? It was, um... <laughs> I left Pola for somebody. Oh, Come on, somebody was must it? have seen was it. it. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. He yeah. just got hair, he gradually got more hair. Is that the one? Yeah. I don't think Liz Shaw had any scenes with him. Stupid. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> um, you had a cameo role in The Five Doctors. Did they uh, just sign you up and ask you whether you do that? Yes, and I wanted the money. <laughs> <laughs> it comes down to money. All. <laughs> when you ask me. It's <laughs> true, yeah. You want the truth? That's what we want. Any hands now? Oh, it's all the yeah, adventurous now. Let's start off with you. Would you like to have had more adventures on other planets? Yes. And I wanted to meet the um, Daleks. I mean, yes. I, I, I think it's terrible to have been in the Doctor Who and never met a Dalek. That's I mean, true, isn't it? it really is horrific. I mean, that's the only thing that interests my children. I mean, the fact that I've been in it is, they don't want to know. <laughs> it's a huge Dalek? embarrassment. <laughs> what are your memories of working with John Levine as Sergeant Benton? Um, <laughs> was a, I was talking to Richard today, Franklin, and actually it was terrific. We were quite a good team, if you know what I mean. You become like a sort of team when you're working for a whole year with people. Actors are rather good at that, actually. Just going straight in and getting on with it, because the work's the important thing, and actually that brings you all together. Unless you're stroppy, and nobody was stroppy, if I remember. Oh, right. I didn't notice anyway. I'm going to pass this down here. If you can just pass it down. This may be in cabinet, but I'm just wondering whose idea was it to give Liz a pipe in the Zero Imperative? Do you really want to know? No, really. Just... I tried to give up smoking for six months. Please all do this. I did the patches, I did everything. This is last summer, and in the end, I got so unhappy and so frantic. Mm -hmm that I bought a little pipe and would pipe smoke in the garden so it wouldn't hurt anyone. But when we went filming, of course, I went behind a truck to have one. And Bill Baggs, who's directing it, saw it and said, oh, well, bring that in. Yes, we'll use that, you see. And I said, you can't. You know, kids watch this. It'll encourage them. But he said, and it'll be a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go and do the choir, which is, you know, you've got about ten stars and people, and there's masses of sparks electrics of people all that around and I'm getting out the pipe and sort of thinking I think they'll think I'm eccentric <laughs> and going behind caravans to have a pipe and in the end I back to smoking cigarettes so I, I'll try by the next convention to have given up again <laughs> someone at the front here again Caroline just asking did you have any practical jokes played on you by any of them, like John Pertwee, or um, can you remember any of them? 
Well, the biggest one was, as I said, going on that first day and being told I was an Eve from the next, but it wasn't a practical joke, it was for real. I don't know, he was very good to me, John. He is like an older brother sort of thing, you know. It, we played them like on Nick Courtney with the patches and things like that. I can't remember, to be honest. But, um, unless anyone else can remember that John stole them and I can't remember because I'm getting ancient. Someone over there. Is someone over there? Ah, right. Over there. He's done it. On the press. But they try and remember some of the things. You'd have to have a few drinks and try and work on what you did. Well, I have to tell you, I can't drink anymore because it's okay. poison. <laughs> I'm a dead loss to this sometimes. Right, we'll start off here. There's someone in front of you as well. Was it you? Gentlemen, oh, right. Could you pass that to him? I thought the Dimensions in Time thing was absolutely brilliant, but there's been a lot of controversy about that, so I wondered what you thought about working on this. The children in need. Why was the controversy on it? A lot of people thought that it was insulting to the programme and that it was just a five minute thing that was cobbled together at the last minute. But I thought it was wonderful. I, I think what was the difficulty in it, that there was only two minutes, two, two, two minutes slots, weren't there? and or very little time to do it and everybody was asked to be in it and we all said yes because we were doing it for children in need so it was very difficult to get so many assistants so many doctors and people from that time into that very short time span i mean i have to tell you when we did it i oh who is the bad lady in that what's her name Kate Amara, who I, I know quite well, she and I didn't realise there were going to be two endings. So there were two little girls from EastEnders and we did the ending and thought that was it and suddenly this great man came and <laughs> she said, what have we got to see that? I said, I don't know, just do it, just do it. And I remember John standing there saying, what's this story about? <laughs> I said, John, don't cast, just do it. <laughs> because we had so little time. I mean, it's quite a big thing to get together, you know, to get going. And people are very divided about whether it was okay or not. Any more hands? Here we go. Good. The one here? Liz is very sceptical and cynical. Is he very similar to the character in uh, The X-Files, the woman that's in that? I mean, was this, was this somewhere that you actually worked out making her very sceptical of the things that were going on in the early episodes that you did? I know. Is that a film, The X-Files? It's a TV thing. I've never seen it, so... The, one of the characters is very similar to Sorry. Liz Shaw. One of the characters in it is very similar in character to Liz Shaw. But I was wondering whether you'd actually uh, deliberately set out to make Liz Shaw very sceptical and cynical at first. In the early episode, certainly in the... Uh, the I, I, the I think there's a there is a thread in that, in the fact that I think she was very sceptical about some of them, the Doctor, at, at the very beginning. She'd been, she doesn't like the army people, so that's, that I do remember. But she's a scientist and she didn't really like all this unit with people killing each other and all that. And she, first of all, until she meets the doctor and realises that his brain is so much more advanced than anything she's ever experienced, she was sceptical of him. But I think there's always been that twist with um, the brigadier that she always thought he was a bit... Nah, really. <laughs> <laughs> I adored Nicholas Courtney. But we had that thing going throughout, I think. She thought he was a bit of a twit. That's good. Uh, no, oh, there we go. Somewhere in the back. Yeah. I'm glad you're laughing. <laughs> I have to yeah. remember, it's 25 years ago, you know. It's a long time uh, back. My name's Ian. What is your telephone experience in the programme? Yeah, what is your most terrifying experience in the programme? Apart from this. I'm not terrified this time. Last year I was. Um, I, I, I think the first day. Just um, because I'd, not, I'd only done one little telly before then. So I was pretty um, scared of everything and everybody. But I'd, the other thing was um, the Marlowe wear doesn't look very slippery in the film. And I had to, it only had a rail one side, and I had these very high boots on. And it was a bit scary, because I was told, run as fast as you can to the end. 
And, you know, he's only got to slip once and you've been down in the rear. And as I said, I was three months pregnant, which I didn't tell anybody because I... They wouldn't have let me do stuff like that if they'd known. So uh, that was a bit scary. Mm. Right. Any question? We can have a top shelf. Just down at the top shelf, which is good. Oh, there are people. Somebody here. Right. I've got two hands up. There's one gentleman stood on the stairs. So we'll grab him. There you go. Yeah. Coming back to play Liz Shaw after 20 years in the Zero Imperative, were there any sort of aspects of the character that you felt you could develop on and show that she changed and grow as that you're now, since you're now playing the lead role? Well, when you do that, I mean, the script dictates how you do it in a way, but I mean, she was in charge, whereas before I was always John's sidekick. So it's quite nice doing that, actually, especially for a woman. It was like in um, a Breach of the Peace when I played DCI Sellers. It's wonderful if you're, for once, the fellows have to say yes, ma'am. And that's what I got with Liz Shaw. I, I quite enjoy doing that. Did you hear that? Did you base that character on Juliet Bravo? No, not at all. I based it on me. <laughs> but you had the accent and everything. Well, I didn't think the accent... I didn't want to do... I come from York, but I... I think that's one thing I didn't do very well because I tried not to make her too Yorkshire and I think it was a little bit neither one thing nor the other. You know, if I'd done, done it like that, then it wouldn't have mattered too much. But I thought, well, if she's a DCI, she's got a little bit more grand. So I tried to make it less, and I'm not sure that it worked. But I love playing the character. I love telling David Troughton where to get off. <laughs> I mean, it's very rare that a woman has that, you know, authority. It's getting more in things we do today in drama. We've got time for just one more question if someone's got one. <coughs> or we've got someone down the front. There's a gentleman here. Is it the front or the back? Yeah, we'll go to the front. Yeah. And this is the last question, so I Yes, I was, I was wondering if you, uh, the story that you've just done with some of Vester and Sophie, whether you could tell us anything about it, what the story's about. Do you mean the audio cassette? Yes. It's about Jack the Ripper and our Black Hockney woman. <laughs> this versatility of God's terrible accents. <laughs> Dear God. <laughs> no, you've got to buy it. I'm not allowed to tell you about it. <laughs> it's about the time of Jack the Ripper. And um, I don't know what went before, but um, Sophie and Sylvester come into the time in London at that time and then try and find out and do a time. It's all to do with the dimension, time dimensions. So you'll have to ask Sophie, see how much she'll give you now, and then Sylvester. I'm sure that was a little bit like you have, just a little bit. Thanks very much for being with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Caroline Jones. <laughs>